Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be checking out more Crash Course. We're going to be continuing their series on Black American History, which has been really good so far and I'm excited to get a little bit further into it. So, first of all, I guess I should acknowledge this, I goofed a little bit. In the first episode, I said I wanted to get away from referring to enslaved people as slaves and use terms that acknowledge their humanity a little bit more, like enslaved people like that that people language is important and uh that people thing it gives them that level of humanity and i thought that was a really good point that this guy made and then by episode two i was back to just calling them slave because it, it's just so ingrained in my brain and breaking a habit is a little bit difficult for me and i am going to try but i'm sorry if i slip back into that the fact that i said it out loud does hold me a little bit more accountable and there are people who are going to be like oh you slipped up again i'm going to try not to get bogged down in the language as well like that that's one of those things if i focus too much on the language sometimes i'm going to be thinking about that so much and not as much about the structure of the point that i'm trying to make so i'm not gonna uh, kill myself over it, but I'm going to try a little bit harder. Uh, so there we go. Uh, now, now that I'm through with that part, let's continue to episode three. This one is about Elizabeth Key. I know a little bit about her story. Not, not the whole thing. I know more the aftermath because I believe Elizabeth Key is the one that kind of triggered the House of Burgesses, which is the legislature in uh, Virginia, to tie the status of slavery to the mother rather than the father, because she had a white father and a black mother, and it, that really causes people to question this gray area in their system so that that's incredibly complicated so elizabeth key is one of the rare cases where she's able to get out of that system and then they're just like we can't afford for these people to be getting out of this system so they they decide they're going to lock them down by tying it to the mother we talked about that in the previous episode and it's it's evil it, it's just absolutely terrible but uh clever clever and bad <laughs> all right so let's let's get started with this For, uh, can i admit something up front i thought it was a i've been saying elizabeth keys when i've talked about this previously uh it's key <laughs> slight goof on my part i've been making a lot of goofs lately hi i'm clint smith and this is crash course black american history it can sometimes feel like lawyers and legislators are always using the law to give us complicated explanations loopholes a messy language that leaves most of us feeling like we have absolutely no idea what's going on. And I mean, Fair. this is understandable. First of all, the law can be hard to decipher. Second of all, the law is pretty much only as fair as its application. Additionally, we can see in our day-to-day -day lives that even though something can be legal, it isn't necessarily fair. Sometimes the law is either designed to be applied in an unjust way or is inherently unjust especially when those in power have the goal of oppressing and profiting off of others. Despite these realities, the beauty of the law, at its best, is that with the right argument and the right application, injustices can be remedied. And to it's very easy for people who are part of groups that might be a little bit disillusioned with the system. It's easy for them to be like, to dismiss the law because the law hasn't given them that many reasons to trust in it. I do agree that there is some inherent beauty in the law. I, I like that there is a system that is above any one individual. I think that's wonderful. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't question it. I, we should always question, okay, why is this the way that it is? I, I think it's always good to be vigilant in that sense. And especially if you are in a group that feels like the law isn't representing you and they're representing perhaps someone else. So I think that's a, a rather good point. It's, it's nice and nuanced. Yeah, let, let, let's not completely dismiss the law, but let, let's make sure that we question it. It's like politicians. I'm not going to completely dismiss them just because they're a politician. I'll listen to what they have to say, but uh, we should always be a little bit adversarial, just a healthy amount of adversarial. Today, we're going to talk about that through the story of Elizabeth Key, 
a woman who obtained her freedom while navigating a deeply unjust system. <laughs> So we're kind of jumping around because this kind of takes place uh, between some of the stuff that's mentioned in the second episode, which, which is I, I, I think it's cool. I don't think this necessarily has to be done chronologically. I think uh, more thematically would is probably a better way to do lessons so while uh, doing things in chronological order is always nice. Uh, uh, Doing, like, the broad theme of the slave system and then going into some specifics, I, I think that's a good structure. I want to note up top that this episode will address some challenging topics, like sexual violence and images of extreme violence. Elizabeth Key was a biracial woman who was born in Warwick sure. County, Virginia, in 1630. She was one of a few enslaved people able to gain her freedom through the colonial legal system. Elizabeth Key's mother was black, but Tanya Lavelle Banks, a legal scholar and professor, states that, at the time, there was probably no meaningful difference between being labeled a Negro and being labeled a slave. According to society and the courts, those labels were effectively the same, because at that time and place, almost all people of African descent were assumed to be enslaved. Mm. Elizabeth's father was a white Englishman named Thomas Key, who arrived in the colony of Virginia in 1616. There is some... So this is an interesting thing, and it... It's, uh, it, there's a big part of English identity at the time that comes into play here because the English are obsessed with this idea of no Englishman, no English person should be a slave, it, that they are inherently free, which what happens when you take an Englishman and mix that with somebody who they think is inherently uh, less than. It, it fits in this system of slavery. What happens if, if you go 50-50 on that? What direction do you go? We'll find that it often leans into the direction of being black and then inherently falling more into the slave system, which pretty fricked up, Doug. Evidence that Thomas did have some emotional attachment to his daughter. In fact, he attempted to make sure Elizabeth was relatively well provided for, but this didn't come to pass. You see, Elizabeth's parents were unmarried. Not only that, but Thomas Key was legally married to another woman while he was involved with Martha, due mm. to her complicated status. Imagine the relationship with the, uh, the daughter and essentially the stepmom in this case. They probably wouldn't have treated it as such a relationship, but I've heard some really uncomfortable stories there because a lot of the time, uh, the uh, the stepmom knows the whole situation. They they know that this is the child of their husband, and then it creates an often adversarial relationship there. And the woman in this case, the 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 uh, stepmom, I'm gonna keep referring to her as such, uh, has a lot of power in that relationship. A lot of room to make their life hell. I don't know about this particular relationship, but it, it, it definitely differs from case to case. But you, you can only imagine. It's awful. Um, I, I wonder if there are any specific studies on just like those kinds of relationships. I, I'm sure there are plenty of examples that one could do a study on all that. I, I don't know if it's been taken on as like the main subject of any studies. As a black child born out of wedlock and a child born of an enslaved woman, Elizabeth was expected to work as an indentured servant until she was a teenager. Her father made hmm. an agreement with a wealthy settler named Humphrey Higginson, who then transferred possession of her to a farmer named John Mottram. She was supposed to be under Higginson's care for nine years, and that stipulation also transferred to Mottram. Her father, however, died soon after making the initial agreement. Oh, no. And Higginson left for England and just never returned. This left Elizabeth in a vulnerable and uncertain position. She was a teenager of African descent with no advocates. So not only... And a woman. But let, let, let's, uh, let's uh, not uh, minimize the fact that not only she's black and young, but she's also a woman. Like, what's a worse position for you to be in from a legal perspective? What's a worse position for you to be in 
uh, when it comes to being taken seriously by the inherently white patriarchal uh, legal system at this time. It, it doesn't get much worse than that. It was she bartered into servitude by her own father. The original terms of the agreement also weren't honored. Elizabeth ended up working for John Mottram for 10 additional years, well past the time that had been laid out in the original agreement. In spite of the situation, though, Elizabeth built as much of a life for herself as possible. She started a relationship with a white indentured servant named William Grinstead, and together they had a child, oh. John. When Mottram died in 1655, the heirs of his estate reclassified Elizabeth and her son John, changing them from indentured servants to enslaved people. This was an attempt by the Keepers. estate to take advantage of the small family and acquire more property by declaring them human chattel. But Elizabeth, she wasn't gonna just stand for this. With William Grinstead, her partner turned lawyer, she took this injustice to the court. But That's a unique relationship right there. And whenever you uh, find people in these sorts of relationships, th this one is unique because they uh, start on a relatively even footing. I, of course, there are the built-in societal po problems there. We were, we're talking about, like, gender and uh, race, which, which would inherently separate them in this societal structure or whatever, but they were both, they both shared the status of indentured servitude early on. So that's uh, actually extremely interesting. Usually when you see these relationships develop, uh, the white guy is in a position of power, which already makes you question like how ethical this is. And usually it's not ethical. It doesn't mean that their relationship didn't have any sorts of uh, affection or whatever, but we look back on it and, and I get uncomfortable with it. I'm like, man, how I, I don't know how you could love that person who's inherently in power over you. It seems so abusive and whatever. And, and I think it's bad. And I it, no, you can't love him. That's bad. Uh, but this, this is their lives, and sometimes people made out of that what they could, even, even when it makes you uncomfortable, even when it's something that, uh, that could be used cynically to somehow justify the position. And there's a whole lot of cynical justification after the fact that occurs when you're talking about slavery as a system, and especially when a lot of the people who... Uh, participated in that system, a lot of us want to like them. Like, I want to like Thomas Jefferson. I want to like George Washington, but they make it so hard sometimes. Arguing that Elizabeth was of African ancestry, a woman, and was also considered illegitimate because her parents were unmarried, the Montreal State argued that Elizabeth was a servant for life and basically already enslaved. But Elizabeth pushed Boo. back this argument. She made three points. The first two arguments focused on her status within slaveholding Virginia, while the last argument focused on the terms of the agreement between her father, Higginson, and the later transfer to John Mottram. Let's go to the thought bubble. First, Elizabeth— uh, I know in a lot of systems—I don't know what it was in Virginia during this time. In a lot of systems, uh, black people were not even allowed to, like— uh, any sort of, they weren't really even allowed legal representation so in, in this case it would be uh it would be the guy here right he they said he is like a lawyer he is like a tur he, he turned lawyer or something so it would be him making the case uh so that's a thing but there there are a lot of things that develop in the different states and uh would be states colonies at this time uh that really prohibit their uh, black people's ability to defend themselves in court. So I, I don't know what the system is at this point. Emphasized that her father was a white, free man, and that she should be granted her freedom because of her paternal lineage. Second, Elizabeth stressed that Good point. she was a baptized Christian, and that she could not be enslaved as a result of her Christian faith. This that is huge, actually. And it took a lot of BS justification for people to get around this, because a lot of people uh, in, in many different systems in the New World would convert to Christianity and then 
inherently it was wrong for you to enslave them. So they had to find ways to justify that because economically they felt like they needed uh, this system to be maintained. But yeah, that was the thing. If you were a Christian, you weren't supposed to be enslaved. This argument may not really resonate with us now, but it was vital in this case because there was some legal debate during this time about whether Christians could, one, enslave other Christians, and more directly, if Christians themselves could be enslaved for life. On the other hand, English indentured servants that sued for their freedom rarely had to address their Christianity or their lineage. They were assumed to be free and Christian solely because, well, they were white. But Elizabeth was forced to address these key points in her case before addressing the unjust enslavement itself. It's a smart point, Third, given her position. Elizabeth's partner and lawyer, William Grinstead, argued that Key should have been free in the first place because the initial agreement said Elizabeth was only supposed to be an indentured servant for a limited amount of time. I mean, if they have the contract, ultimately, they should the win. Arguments did compel the court to rule in Elizabeth's favor, freeing both her and her son. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Good job, Liz. So this story of lawyers, legislators, and the law actually had a happy ending. Elizabeth and her son were freed. She legally married William Grinstead, and they all lived happily ever after. Right? Question mark? The other side of this is that Elizabeth lost years of her life because she was subject to a woefully unjust system that was designed to protect the practice of holding human beings as property. And it's clear that a white indentured servant under similar circumstances would just not be required to jump through any of those legal hoops. Furthermore, many individuals who were subject to similar injustices during this time actually did not receive their freedom, whether they made it to court or not. The reality is that, mm -hmm. put simply, Elizabeth was lucky. Very. If only lucky people win in the legal system, then how just is the system in the first place? The story of Elizabeth Key is a powerful example of perseverance and accountability and one that's still worth reflecting on today. It's a compelling and even an inspiring story. One of a woman who fought back against a system that attempted to keep her and her son in chains. And she won. But as inspiring as her story is, it also serves as a reminder that Elizabeth's story is the exception to the rule. That the vast majority of people who found themselves in similar positions to Elizabeth Key were not able to go to court and litigate their way to freedom. And as a result of Elizabeth's story, they're going to try to step their game up and put greater legal restri restrictions in place so that there can't be another Elizabeth Key. She was uh, the inception of the idea that, OK, we, now we need to lock down. We, we can't have uh, all these people finding their freedom through the legal system. So let, let's lay down some law and make sure that they can't, which, oof. Stories like hers I feel like that's are the last word in all my just things on here. Rare. And it's oof. because they are so rare that they remind us of the larger systemic issues that so many black people faced. People whose names we'll never know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next Ooh, time. Oh, slave codes, yes. Help of all these nice people. That one is going to be very interesting. Like, uh, uh, definitely a more uh, legal approach. Th this is like a personal, more biographical approach, despite the legal elements to it. Uh, slave codes are definitely going to go into, like, more of the minutia of uh, what it meant to be enslaved and what your rights were, what the rights were for uh, the people who held you in that system. Like, it, there's going to be a whole lot for there. So I, I'm really excited about this. Uh, this has been a really fun series. Um, I'm going to be continuing it. Uh, I'm surprised I've kept up with it. I, I managed to get episode two out before episode three came out, and I got this one done like almost immediately after it came out so I, i'm i'm actually pretty happy with this uh, holding myself to a schedule is uh not something i'm good at so uh just let me have a, a moment of pride there so thank you guys for watching if there's anything else you want me to check out leave it in the comment section below and uh yeah thanks and i will see you next time all right